10, so I'd like to not keep you waiting too long. My name is Carrie Wade, and thank you for coming. We're here to talk about harm reduction and um, public health. I'd like to thank Center Forward and Future Forum Foundation for working with our street to put this together. We're very happy to be talking about this. It's been a long time coming. Um, my name is Carrie Wade, I'm the Director of Harm Reduction Policy at the R Street Institute. Our focus areas are opioids, tobacco, and uh, sexual health. To my left, yes, left, <laughs> is Dr. Julie Gunther. She is a board certified family physician, the founder of Spark MD, which is a primary care clinic um, in Boise, Idaho. She started this clinic in 2014 in reaction to rising health care administrative costs and felt that this aspect of medicine had compromised her relationship with her patients. And from talking to her last night, it sounds like since she started, she's actually kind of regained some of the control of the physician. Uh, patient relationship. To my far left is Dr. Michael Mandel. He's the chief, econo chief economic, economic strategist at the Progressive Policy Institute with a focus on the impact of regulation on innovation and policies focusing on regulatory improvement. His analysis really covers the basis from the app economy, which is something I know absolutely nothing about. I assume it's beyond my candy crush, and <laughs> to manufacturing and to the healthcare economy. But at the core of these various topics is really how um, innovation can improve our lives. So I would just like to start off with a brief introduction of what harm reduction is and what we're here to talk about. So harm reduction is really um, the philosophy that drug use per se or risk behavior per se is not the problem, but how, it's, um, how we do it. And that there can be ways to mitigate the risks associated with it. So really reduction of drug use is one possible means to address public health goals. It's pragmatic, focusing on short-term solutions rather than long-term ideals. It's person-centered, meaning that not all strategies are going to be good, great for everybody. And it really does focus on stigma, so reducing stigma associated with drug use or risk behaviors is um, really of uh, primary importance. So when you think about syringe access programs, which is a harm reduction um, program that is geared towards people with injection drug use, um, we see that their primary outcome, which is syringe access programs, are there to reduce the incidence of infectious disease, so HIV or HCV, or hepatitis C virus, sorry, um, that syringe access programs have had really great benefits in reducing um, infectious disease transmission. But what we don't see with um, syringe access program is an increase in drug use initi initiation. And this has been um, proven since, I think the first study looking at this was in 1991, and these are all government-funded studies that show in areas that have um, implemented syringe access programs, you don't see an increase in drug use around those areas. So this is um, a really important point. It's, um, you also see an increased entry into treatment programs for people who access syringe exchange programs. And this is probably because it's another point of intervention where people are um, you know, getting more information about how to uh, deal with drug use. And we also see that as cost effective. So in Washington, D.C., I believe it was 2012, they invested, the city invested $600,000 into um, syringe access programs, expanding syringe access programs in this city. And we saw in, not only a major in, decrease in the incidence of HIV, but there was estimated cost savings of $120 million. So you can see it's incredibly effective. Um, when we look, think about smoking, we're thinking about the continuum of risk. So um, Public Health England, which is a, a, not a governing body, but it's like the equivalent of CDC in the United States, has acknowledged that tobacco products exist on a continuum of risk. So cigarettes and scars are at the highest, um, or sorry, little scars are at the highest in health impacts at 100% continuum, or 100% risk, you would say. And then something like nicotine patch, lozenge, um, gum, e-cigarettes, uh, other reduced risk products are at the very low end of the continuum of risk. And there's a nice graphic that I, we don't have a screen to show you, but. Um, we can see that the risks are about 95% less. Um, we see that e-cigarettes or um, these other products do are effective at producing uh, cessation from combustible cigarettes. And we can see that these products also um, improve health outcomes for people who smoke. So people with uh, COPD, which is a, a chronic obstructive pulmonary <laughs> disease. <laughs> Thank you. I always screwed those words up. Um, they, people have health improvements and decreases exacerbations when they switch from combustible cigarettes to cigarettes. 
Of course, these health outcomes are, um, e-cigarettes have not been around for a very long time, so the long-term health outcomes are yet to be known, but um, within the last few years, you've seen a lot more studies examining these health outcomes. So like I say, my program area at R Street really does focus on smoking, opioid use, and sexual health. Um, in the and when we talk about opioid use, we're talking about it in the context of illicit behavior, and illicit drug use, and in pain management, which I think is a little bit um, new to think about harm reduction in the context of pain management. Um, I think that a philosophy of harm reduction can be broadly applied to pretty much every area of life and can be used to improve public health goals. Um, in the way I think about it in our street, and our street is free market um, libertarian think tank, so we focus a lot on regulation here. So smoking, um, examining regulation of innovative products and reduced risk products, um, increasing access to reduced risk products, or keeping them available. They are pretty well accessible in the United States, but you know they're at risk with um, FDA regulations or state and local regulations. Um, the opioid crisis, we want to decrease barriers to medicated or medication assisted therapy, um, which is methadone, buprenorphine, um, drugs that help people switch from heroin to a uh, safer form of an opioid. Um, so we want to remove buprenorphine prescribing limits. We want to remove the requirement for daily visits to receive methadone, which is a huge barrier for people. Heroin should not be easier for people to access than methadone for people who are trying to get off of heroin. Um, for pain management, we want to increase, we support the 21, 21st Century Cures Act, which is to decrease the um, barrier to FDA uh, approval of new drugs. And in the context of pain, I mean, this, the 21st Century Cures Act is used for many disease states, but uh, many types of drugs. But when you think about opioids, think about pain med medication. Um, keeping product or keeping drugs available for uh, research purposes because research is always evolving. We often hear concerns that the pendulum has swung too far. So we aim to from in the context of pain management. So I know the Washington Post article that was out last week. It's really informative how many prescription opioids have entered our communities. Um, we want to make sure that that is contained, but that people are not denied access to pain medication. Um, my background is in pain research. It's kind of an important subject for me. Um, and we, like I said, aim to enable regulation that supports research into innovative and novel <coughs> programs. So now I will, you have the lay of what I think, and you know, uh, where I stand. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gunther and she can talk about her experience as a primary care physician. Thank you. Um, so good morning. I'm excited to be here. I'm actually from Idaho. How many people have actually ever met anyone from Idaho? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are good. <laughs> so we must travel. Um, so I'm a family physician, a board certified family physician, which means I've done all the training and all the tests and the maximum amount of stuff you can do to be a, a legit MD. I'm also future president of an organization called the Direct Primary Care Alliance. Direct Primary Care is a cash-based healthcare model that's sort of up and coming and we're a pretty noisy group. Um, I'm also a steering committee member for an organization called the Direct Primary Care Coalition, so I've been here before talking about direct primary care. But today I'm here actually as Julie Gunther, uh, Dr. Gunther, to talk about my own experiences and my own opinions. So I'm not representing any of the organizations I sometimes am here about. Um, Harm reduction is sort of uh, a new and a not new concept to me as a physician. So I've been a practicing physician for um, 18 years if I count when I started med school and 14 years if we count when they like set the leash free and let me start to make my own decisions. Um, I've practiced largely in Seattle, rural Indiana, and then back in my hometown of Boise, Idaho, which is actually sort of an upcoming, fairly affluent community, which is not what it was when I was young. Um, and. Um, in the, the place where I trained in Indiana actually had one of the highest rates of smoking and obesity in the country. So that was a, a fun place to train and a fun place to learn about a lot of barriers to um, healthy behavior. Uh, I read an interesting article about harm reduction. You know, the, most everyone's heard that the, the oath or part of, part of a physician's creed, right, is, is do no harm. Um, but actually in everything I do, I have to think about harm. So not even talking about tobacco or opiates or anything, but um, diabetes management, COPD, or lung disease management. When I prescribe any medication, the first conversation I have with the patient is, are the benefits of this medication better than the harms of the unmanaged disease? Does that make sense? Um, 
So, so speaking directly to tobacco use and opiate use and birth control access and a number of other things, it's interesting that we have a very absolute approach, uh, which is you need to quit smoking. And that's what most of the governing uh, physician bodies educate us. Or, or we have the war on drugs, which implies we can win a war and not have drugs. Um, but I guess a transition point for me was realizing that people fundamentally don't tend to do what's in their best interest. They do what feels good and solves short-term problems. Um, and as a healthcare provider, as a physician, if, if I don't respect that people aren't going to do what I say and generally aren't going to do what's in their best interest, I'm going to get burned out really fast. So providing care with dignity uh, means meeting people where they are and being able, having not, not just the time, but having the education and the resources, the policy resources, to, to support people um, in less than perfect transitions. Um, so a few testimonials, which I always think are, are the, the most fun, uh, but also pretty horrific. Um, I have a patient who I just diagnosed with endometrial cancer and referred her to oncology. Um, she, it's probably terminal, um, which is very uncommon for endometrial cancer. So that's uterine lining cancer, which is, which is generally thought to be a slow growing, not a, big, not a big deal, but unfortunately for her, it's a big deal. Chemo is so painful for her that she's debating quitting her chemotherapy. And that is the only way she will survive this disease. Her oncologist has refused to prescribe pain medicines. I had a bilateral mastectomy because I had breast cancer three years ago. I had never had opiates or benzodiazepines in my life. I woke up from my surgery and heard the nurse say that I had had some fentanyl. Um, I got taken to the floor. About four hours later, I had some pain. They gave me Tylenol. About an hour after that, I was crying, and I'm a pretty sturdy, pretty tough lady. I did grow up hunting and fishing and all that. It took an hour and a half before I got pain medicine because I knew to say, I know I got fentanyl, and I don't know if that helped, and I know I have an order for PRN and Norco because my doctor told me that. They didn't look at my chart. They didn't see that I was a physician, and they accused me of wanting excessive pain medicines six hours after I had both breasts surgically removed. I have another patient who just had necrotizing fasciitis, which is very exciting, but not if you're the patient. Um, so this is legit primary care, guys. Family doctors do crazy <laughs> stuff. Um, so uh, she's uninsured, unfortunately. She had emergency surgery. Sent um, home three days later, I saw her, no pain medicine. Massive part of her lower abdomen removed. So the pendulum on pain medication management has swung so far that people with legitimate pain are not being served because physicians aren't prescribing pain medicines, because physicians are terrified. So um, getting to tobacco, I have practiced medicine for 13 years. My dad's an avid smoker. He's really good at it. I love the smell of a menthol cigarette right when it's lit. I've never smoked, but oh, I love that smell, probably because it's like a remnant of my childhood. In my entire 14 years of begging, pleading, talking, hours spent in discussion, I have had zero smokers, actually. zero people who smoke actually quit because of my efforts. Zero. And at one point I was qualified at working 83 hours a week and would see 22 people a day five days a week. So I can't even do that math. And yeah, people come in an average of 2.7 times a year. Can't even do that math. But when I was challenged that, what if we had more tools? What if we had the option to say, okay, I'm not even gonna, if you're not interested in quitting, let's talk about a transitional option. Let's talk about <coughs> a heat not burn option. Let's talk about something that you're still getting your nicotine, which is, is what we're addicted to. And nicotine is an amazing chemical, biochemically. Um, it solves a lot of problems, anxiety, depression. Anyway, that's the problem with it, right? That's why people like it. But what if, we, what if people could have nicotine without the, the harmful products of combustion? Um, and that's, that's sort of a new dialogue for me, and it's definitely a new dialogue for traditional physicians, because the physician culture often sees that if we compromise, we're saying something bad is okay. But that's not how we manage the rest of our lives, right? We say, okay, if we can improve, if you have to lose 100 pounds and you can lose 50, I mean, high five, that's amazing. We don't say, well, if you can't lose 100, we're not going to have any other options. So, so my personal and professional testimonial is just that, that any tools we can provide in healthcare, in, in, in population-based care, all the way down to the individual, that allow people to come part way in their, in their efforts to go all the way are things that benefit individuals, they benefit physicians who work with individuals, and they benefit our populations as a whole. Um, so at the end, I'm happy to tell more stories, because those are always horrible, stories horrible are, and fun. Stories are great. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, um, it gets to a point of insanity when you work directly with people and, and your hands are tied. 
Um, one other comment, for example, um, naltrexone, naloxone. So I'm held accountable to make sure I prescribe that if any patients are using on prescription opiates appropriately or using illicit opiates if they choose to tell me about that. My patients can't afford it. So I can do all the right things to make sure I don't have Board of Pharmacy oversight, but when the rubber hits the road, generally if someone has $32, which is the cash price for a double syringe of naltrexone, assuming they know how to use it, um, they're not gonna spend it on that. So, so, so we either accept that, that we're doing administratively what's right, but in real practice people are still gonna die because people are going to do what feels good. Um, eventually many people grow beyond that, but, but we all have to go through that phase, I guess. So, so um, I'll shut up with my sort of personal testimonial and see if you have questions or transition to, to Dr. Michael. Um, I just have one, well, one question, well, two questions really. Um, one is, you talk a lot about the pain, um, you know, physicians being hesitant to prescribe opioids. With these guidelines that um, where they started to be in place about 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. The um, Have you seen an improvement in addiction outcomes? So I, so boots on the ground, people, my patients lie to me, and I take people at their word. I, I have a trust but verify approach with some of my patients. Um, so, so I haven't, I've seen a slight improvement and it's only because I moved from rural Indiana where all the factories had closed back to Idaho where people have jobs, the part of Idaho where people have jobs. But, but academically, I'm not aware that there's actually been any improvement in utilization of either illicit prescription opiates or, or heroin. The other commentary that's a whole other policy thing is I was a hospice medical director, so I was probably one of the leading prescribers of methadone as a pain medication in Idaho for a couple years because it's an amazing pain medicine at the end of life. It's a very, very important tool at the end of life when people are really suffering and nothing else will work. Um, in my tenure while working for hospice, uh, federal legislation changed and disallowed hospice nurses from destroying medications left at the home after the deceased passed away because they're defined as the patient's family's property. So, so we can talk about that later. So that's a whole other, I didn't understand that. As we're pressuring physicians to prescribe less opiates, or be more mindful of diversion and addiction, we're leaving copious amounts of opiates and benzodiazepines in the home of people who have just passed away. Um, so we can talk about that too, but she didn't know I was gonna bring that up. But so, so um, from a physician standpoint, which is kind of my job today, I, I'm on a forum with 300 female physicians in Idaho, it's Idaho women physicians, and last year, there was a debate of a whole bunch of primary care physicians saying, I'm just not gonna prescribe pain meds or opiates anymore. I work with a neurologist who doesn't even have her controlled substance license anymore because she didn't want to deal with it. Neurologist. So, so people are going to suffer because physicians are afraid uh, because you'll see everywhere the accusations are this problem is from physician prescribing. And there are some, some bad actors out there, there always are, and I think we need to figure out elegant ways to, to make sure we're attentive to that. But, but what's happening is the run-of-the-mill primary care physician is, is washing their hands with this. Yeah, my other question is about um, smoking. Mm -hmm. There's, I'm sure many people in this room will be at some hearings that are coming up this week and probably many in the future on um, e-cigarettes. What, so there's a meeting, to, there's a hearing mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, what would you like, as a physician, what would you like people to know? The policymakers. So I think the, the in my understanding, and you guys probably know the data better, the only thing that's really been effective in reducing cigarette smoking is reducing cigarette initiation. Mm -hmm. So, so, but, but I don't know that anyone can comment that we figured out how to stop teenagers from doing stupid things. <laughs> so, 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 anything we sell that's available to adults, young people are going to get their hands on. So, and I mean, alcohol would be the greatest role model of that. I, I think, I think being mindful about you know, not purposely targeting young people with products, um, which I, I even, even big tobacco, in my opinion, I, I doubt there's people who are like, let's get a 13-year-old hooked. You know, I mean, most people well, there are, are bad. So the jewel specifically, or vaping devices, or e-cigarettes, which are really poorly named. I wish they would have named them something else. Uh, these are all alternatives for adult smokers who already smoke to work on cessation. Um, they're an opportunity for someone to consume nicotine without me having to suck in the products of combustion around them. So they're an opportunity for my dad to 
to get his nicotine fix in front of my 14 year old and 11 year old without like them having to sit in a smoke bubble like I did. So, so these, are, these are useful products when purchased and used appropriately for people who shouldn't smoke but do or already want to quit. Um, but I think, I think youth consumption is a problem. What is it, like 20% of young people have tried it? Something like that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I don't know what to do about that. I guess, I guess I take care of a lot of adolescents and I'm just excited when they tell me they're having sex in a green and blonde depot. So like, like, <laughs> I come from a, a place of assuming people are going to get themselves into harmful situations, especially when they're young and their brain's not developed. I wish they wouldn't or they didn't have access, but I don't know how you exercise that in a free market situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now we'll move on to Dr. Mandel. Well, I could, I could listen to Dr. Gunther all morning. <laughs> I've been taking notes. Um, uh, and because uh, what you're saying is so interesting and so, so rich in terms of what's actually happening on the ground. Okay, uh, and I'm going to provide more what, from the 50,000 foot level. Uh, first, I actually want to say I love these small meeting rooms. It makes me think about those tiny house shows. <laughs> you know, all kind of crammed in here really close. It makes it feel like there's a lot of people because no, you can't, you can't get very many people in. Um, I'm the chief economic strategist for the Progressive Policy Institute. If you don't know us, we're uh, a moderate think tank. Our motto is radically pragmatic. Uh, we've been around for almost 30 years at this point. We do a lot of focus on innovation and growth in all sorts of different areas. Uh, and, and with a lot of emphasis on creation of jobs and improvement of living standards and simply making, how to make people better off, how to make, actually how to make ordinary people better off. And kind of one of our mantras is that innovation, the word innovation is, you know, used in a mythical sense, but really it's about the development of products and services that are better than what's already out there and better and, can, you know, just make people better off. And if you want to, for those of you who can remember your college economics course, okay, innovation is about pushing out the production possibility frontier, really allowing people a, a, a lot more possibilities. And so this is kind of how we got into the harm reduction space. We sort of, you know, we saw uh, that there was companies that were developing less harmful alternatives to cigarettes that were actually appealing to people. Okay, you sort of talk about how it's difficult to get people to change their behavior. Well, one way to change their behavior is to actually offer them something that they enjoy. Okay, and so there's a variety of, of alternatives out there. I mean, you know, people sort of you know, know them. Um, and, the, and the whole notion is, is that they're less harmful, they are something that is a compelling alternative to cigarettes, and therefore make people better off. It reduces the harm to them in terms of their health, okay? And is actually sort of feasible. Um, and this is a good thing. This is, in, in our view, this is real innovation. And, you know, whereas R Street is a libertarian organization, TPI is not, okay? We believe in a healthy balance between regulation and innovation. In this case, it's really pretty clear that regulation is needed to both verify health claims and to make sure that young people don't have, uh, are, are not being sort of given access to these things that they shouldn't be having, okay? And as you point out, People are young people, but okay. And you know, sort of from our perspective, uh, this is kind of a, 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 a no-brainer because we all know that you know that cigarettes are very difficult for people to sort of get off, and anything that we can offer them to do this um, is a real is a real is a real plus. Um, we haven't dealt very much with the improved pain management question, but it's obviously very, very significant as well. Um, and so I think kind of 
the bottom line for us in terms of policy is that you know we we, we believe in uh, in the importance of regulation. We do a lot of work on regulatory improvement, okay, but not to the extent of deterring innovation. Because at the end of the day, innovation is what gets us out of the box of feeling hopeless. It enables. It's what creates. It's what creates a bigger pie for everybody. It's what sort of makes people better off. And as policymakers, we have to pay attention to the to the larger issues here. So I'm actually just going to stop right there because I love people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have one question for you. And you're talking since you're the expert on um, innovation and regulation. What does the future of tobacco harm reduction look like? And have we reached kind of the best Achievable, um, you know, new new products or something. And no, I think that I think that there's a healthy dialogue going on at this point between between uh, regulators and uh, and innovators. Okay, and I think that this is going to continue moving forward. It would be a terrible shame if it got stymied. Um, and um, so no, I don't think we've sort of reached the end of the road on this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, in general, we're we're not in favor of sweeping discussion under the rug, okay? Because the fact is, is that innovation moves by fits and starts. Um, I've sort of been very impressed by the in innovation in this space, but I don't think it's the last word. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. We, as a society, have to sort of realize that there's a lot of things that people do that are for enjoyment. And we have to kind of accept that as part of life, because it's one of the things that makes life human. <laughs> yes, it is. We agree with that. Um, well, Julie and I spoke yesterday about um, one of our street's other projects, which is birth control access. And this is a little bit of a di diversion from, but it still is, um, can be thought of in the context of harm reduction, increasing access to something that can help um, prevent really negative outcomes such as unwanted pregnancy and abortion. Um, you know, you were talking, when we were talking on the phone, you were saying that the, the current birth control process is designed to fail. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? Sure, how many, how many of you seen the Amy Schumer, like, 15 second bit about birth control. Okay, it's super hilarious and it's exactly real. Basically, you gotta watch it. But anyway, to summarize, she goes into a pharmacy to get her birth control pill and gets like the third degree and then only gets one month and then she's like, oh my God, I have to come back and do this again next month. And then a little boy comes in and asks for a gun and they sell him a gun. So and she's, she's kind of spoofing, but, but what's interesting is we now, with the Affordable Care Act, birth control under most insurance plans is free. So, or should be free. Certain forms of it are free, I guess I should say. Um, what's interesting is the um, alternatives such as the patch, the vaginal ring, things that are, have lower failure rates because they don't re require someone to remember to take them every day, by most insurances are seen as equivalents to a pill. So most of what's free or paid for are birth control pills. Um, but what's interesting is a large number of insurance plans will pay for one month at a time. Um, and you can't refill medications within 72, you can refill within 72 hours of the next due date. So, so in its most extreme form, there are a number of women out there who are getting birth control who have to go to the pharmacy 12 times a year within a three day window, assuming, and where I live, there's one 24 hour pharmacy, one. So you screw up and the pharmacies don't enter transfer prescriptions. So if I send it to Rite Aid, and the Walgreens is the 24-hour one. My patients actually have my personal cell phone number, and this, so we can solve that problem, but like normal people can't until Monday. Um, there's all sorts of other details about reproduction that probably are more doctory, but if a woman misses a pill within seven days of intercourse, even seven days prior, she could, she's at risk of getting pregnant. So long story short, we have this benefit that one of my colleagues says is basically like having a coupon for a liver and onion sandwich. Um, which is, if you really love liver and onions, great. But, but what's crazy is if a woman has a prescription for 12 months of birth control, she can walk in the pharmacy and pay cash herself. Um, at our clinic, they can, she can pay cash or get it wholesale, which is about six bucks a month. So, so long story short, birth control in this harm reduction space is, again, people have access to something 
that is going to reduce the potential outcome, undesired outcome, of a, I know we call uh, consensual sex high-risk behavior when people are younger, I kind of, anyway, that's, that's another discussion, right? But, but someone's trying to be responsible for their own health care and not have a health outcome that they're not ready for or they don't want, and we make it almost impossible. It's kind of like the iPhone updates, right, where you start to wonder, like, I updated my phone and now it doesn't work. Is this designed to fail? <laughs> um, um, and I can see why many women feel like that about their birth control options. Um, so, so anyway, that, that's another area where this is very much my own personal opinion, but I think birth control should be over the counter, but that's like a whole radical, probably another group, but, um, but <laughs> so give people access to it. Well, I'll just warn you now, we're, our street will be, within a month, we'll be publishing our over the counter birth control white paper and they'll all get it. There you go. Um, but yeah, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that people might have on tobacco, opioids, and birth control since you brought it up. <laughs> so, yes. My name is Andrew White. Um, I'm a student at a Arizona State University. And uh, so, you know, the, you mentioned the war on drugs, right? And basically the idea behind that is reducing supply. And then here we're talking about reducing harm. Is it feasible or possible to create policy where we reduce demand and reducing the hopelessness that uh, addicts face through courts or through, you know, try to get them into treatment? remove that stigma to remove the demand instead of trying to you know, constantly fight this fight against supply, which obviously hasn't been working. I, I have a thought. So, you know, the supply exists because of the demand or vice right. versa. Um, and, and very long but very short conversation on an individual basis. I talk to all of my patients about their toolbox. And people fill their toolbox with things that solve problems. That doesn't mean their tools are healthy for them. So I, I think you get in a big dialogue about the social determinants of health. And I think there's an uptick in substance use and abuse, largely because the average American's pretty despondent about what's going on culturally. Um, so that's kind of like big Debbie Downer of the day. Um, but, but people don't use drugs because they're hopeful and highly functioning and believe they have opportunity in front of them. Um, people don't spend their only dollar on alcohol or cigarettes because they believe if they save, they'll have an opportunity tomorrow. So we have a very large culture of poverty in our country, and, and when you live in a culture of poverty, I mean, you can be poor, but you can also have a culture of poverty, and they're actually very different things. But people who've grown up or live in a culture of scarcity or uncertainty tend to invest in their time and energy in things that, that feel good right now. So, so if we wanted to decrease demand for harmful things, if we wanted to decrease people's desire to have sex when they're 14 or decrease people's desire for tobacco or opiates or, or heroin or anything else, I think, I don't think that's something we can solve with a singular policy. I think we have to look at broadly what's happening culturally in our nation to lead people to have not a lot of hope. So your, your quote was awesome. Innovation gets us out of the box of feeling hopeless. And when I look at someone who smokes or who has an opiate addiction, if, if what I have to offer is this old fashioned, um, I would say paternalistic, but I don't really like that word, but this old fashioned sort of from down on high, you have to quit. I'm, I'm not resonating in any way with the real reason someone is dependent on that substance. Uh, because tobacco and opiates, for some people, are the only way they're getting through tomorrow. And while it's faulty thinking, um, people I, I do believe many people are doing the best they can. Thank you. Yeah. Do we lose? <laughs> with tobacco control policy, having, you know, indoor smoking bans and advertising bans and, you know, state-supported cessation programs. And that's what's gotten us from, you know, 21% smoking rates in 2012 to 15% now. But when we think about harm reduction and who we're helping with these types of um, programs, there are certain populations that find it really difficult to quit, and that could be a person who's smoking for a longer period of time, a person who just simply doesn't want to quit smoking, or there's certain demographics, you know, people with uh, GED have a 45% smoking rate, people with a PhD have a 5% smoking rate. It's like there are populations that are just very hard to reach with traditional... Is that causal? Demand. Is it causal? I don't know. No. <laughs> um, but we, uh, but so we have seen demand reduction work but it doesn't work for everybody, and that's what harm reduction tries to um, get towards. Yes? Uh, so I 
question about the, um, your opinion on the other side of the coin, not only just like high drug prices when it comes to battling addiction or giving an alternative, but the high insurance costs, especially when it comes to inpatient uh, addiction care or inpatient medical care, because on average, one night at a hospital program is $30,000. And so if you already have a poor, um, I guess, population group from your standpoint, what's the, um, I guess, the fix there? Or what can we do as policy to make that better, to make those routes um, easier to come by? So if people didn't hear, your question is about, is, is a great question about treatment options, right? So we didn't really even touch on that. We were talking about that last night, though. Um, so say I have someone who comes in who has a heroin addiction and say they say, I want to quit. I don't really have a lot to offer them. Um, I don't, I can't, I can prescribe methadone for pain, but not for, um, for heroin because it's two separate licenses and I, and I don't do that work. Um, but, uh, but that's a very good question. What could we do? I'll tell you what I think, what I would love to have. It's not financially realistic for our country, I'm guessing, but I would, I would love to go back to where um, insurance companies allowed people to have a 30-day stay in the rehab facility for alcohol addiction, opiate addiction, drug addiction. I, I personally am a firm believer that um, outpatient programs are very, very difficult places for people to have success. I mean, they're better than, than no program. Um, but you're exactly right. Once, if people are motivated to absolutely quit, how do we how do we support them in a way that that's successful? And I don't. I, as a physician, don't have access to very many resources unless my patients have thirty or forty thousand. And most one month long programs are about thirty to forty thousand. Um, those aren't the super swanky ones. Um, but I have had one patient actually uh, with an opiate addiction, a pretty severe opiate addiction. Uh, transfer to me from a physician who was providing him with a lot of opiates, unfortunately. Um, it was well intended, but it got out of hand. And um, we weaned down all his other controlled substances um, and then had a heart-to-heart, -heart, and it came to a point of total crisis, and he actually consented to go to a facility in California. Um, his loved one was able to negotiate the cash price down, and he actually he actually sent me a card about a week ago that said, um, thank, you for not, thank you for not letting me F up my life which was really sweet of him, but like that's, that doesn't, like that just doesn't happen um, generally. So, so it would be awesome if, if for insured people, if, if there was an inpatient stay requirement, um, but a lot of people when they're at their point of crisis don't have insurance because they have to hit their bottom and their bottom usually involves the loss of just about everything they've had. So in a perfect world, what would be amazing is if these, there were these magical places that were clean and supportive <laughs> and totally understood and people could go there and stay there for a month and get education and maybe get their GED or you know have sort of a pause from society stresses with no access to drugs, removal from their current problematic social circle and, and could restore their own lives uh, with just like a, I guess like a life pause. I don't, I don't know who pays for that. We're paying for it anyway. We really are. Did they show up the same way? Yeah. yeah, we're paying for it anyway. I'm sort of um, sitting here thinking about how one would fund something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that would, that would be amazing. But you guys all work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you've been waiting, so you go, and then, okay. then you do. <laughs> all right. Thanks. I'm Jacob from Congressman Neal's office. Um, there was a comment you made, Dr. Gunder, earlier about a change with hospice medication and I know there have been a ton of workarounds to that, like loaning the medicine or even going so far as to temporarily annex rooms in people's houses so that you never give anything. Um, so when it comes to pain medicine or some of the other topics, what sort of workarounds for good or for bad are happening now? And then what sort of workarounds for good or for bad are happening, would happen that you can predict under the changes that you guys are proposing? What do you, what do you mean by workarounds? I mean, in that sense, you were talking about a recent law change in hospice, and right, how that? we're getting around that by some weird legal loopholes. And when it comes to prescribing pain medication in the wider sense, people are getting around certain laws and weird legal loopholes. So in both the current system and then also, because you're proposing right. a bunch of changes, how do you sort of predict and therefore prevent Certain um, certain issues here. Do you want to say something? You think for a second. Yeah. Okay. You go. 
<laughs> um, we have we have population management policy and individual. Um, one thing I think is a radical idea. So if I write a prescription for a medicine and you go get it and you pay for it, by law it's yours. But could it also be mine because I wrote for it, it has my name on it, and I'm legally accountable to it. So when a patient dies and there's medications with my name on them because I prescribed them, can I be the primary authority that delegates my nurse to destroy them? Why are they the next of kin's property? Because I'm legally held accountable for what happens to them when the 18-year-old comes in after crashing the car high on her grandma's methadone, which happened, right? And where does an 18-year-old get methadone? In my community, you get it from a hospice patient. That's where you get methadone. So, so anyway, so I've wondered that. I'm like, okay, if we're gonna deal with the logistics of this and talk about property, if I prescribed it, I'm legally held accountable to it, and it's not in the hands of the person I prescribed it for, then then is it mine? I don't want it to come back to me because then I'm like a methadone recovery clinic and I don't want that. But like legally, can I delegate someone to destroy it? Like my hospice nurse on site goes in and, and with my signature is advised to destroy all medicines with my name on them. That's one, that, that's a, but that's not a policy we're talking about, but hey, if someone wants to run with that, that'd be awesome. awesome. <laughs> We'd get a lot of drugs off the street now. But, um, it's an interesting question and I'm not prepared to answer it. <laughs> but, Do your organizations have um, recommendations or any sort of uh, sense in our media-saturated society um, when, uh, obviously, the messages, for example, on vaping is that vaping is super cool and um, kids are all taking it up. Um, and if you turn the clock back, for example, about 10 years to mm -hmm. advertising that, that Purdue and other um, uh, opioid manufacturing companies we're presenting to our society and specifically to physicians about the wonders of, uh, of opioids and how very few side effects and so forth, uh, if any. I, I'm wondering if uh, when you talk about the messages that are coming through to people that undoubtedly have a role in driving their behavior, um, what do your organizations think about, about bumpers or guardrails uh, on, on advertising? That's a, that's a really good question. But let me actually put this in a wider frame at this point. So we're, across a wide range of areas, we're tackling, having to face the question of what sort of information are people being provided by, in all sorts of areas, okay? And, sh and so it's always a balance between free information versus, versus vetted, okay? And I'm not even sure yet we've quite wrapped our hands around how we want to sort of frame this, frame this issue because in some sense there's more information available than ever before, and we sort of have this feeling that less of it is trustworthy. I'm not quite, I mean, so so this to me, what you're talking about is a is a is a sort of falls kind of within that classification. Okay, I mean, you're sort of post. It's pretty clear that the pain medication advertising was wrong. Okay. Was it that clear? And I'm not saying anything in favor. Was it that clear at the time? You know, how can you know when can we identify these things as being as being problems? Because you could sort of go around the other way. You could sort of say, well, should we have advertising out there that push people away from well that towards using aspirin in terms of health in terms of heart disease? Okay, and so. I mean, I'm sort of with you on, on kind of on the individual issues, right? As they come up, you sort of say, okay, we need to deal with you to deal with that issue, okay? 100%, okay? I'm sort of puzzled kind of for myself about the larger question about how to stop the next one, okay? How do we, what are we, what are we actually trying, what are we actually trying to do there? Because this, we're, we're really kind of at the early stages of, innovation in these things that sort of, most of which will make people better off. Some of them will turn, we think people make people better off, but will turn out to be problems. And others are bad faith, all right? And so how do we kind of sort through this? And so, you know, in the cases you give, it's kind of straightforward right now, we know the answer. To that. Well, I'm more with worried, vaping, we're not really sure. I'm more, well, I'm more worried. I'm more worried about the 
catching the next one, catching what is the next opioid crisis, and how can we catch that in an early stage, and make sure it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't happen. So that's you know from from that's the way that I always sort of think about it because I see a lot of a lot of issues out there, not just this one, that are similar in terms of do we want to be in the business of controlling information, and if so. Who do we want to be in that business? One of the um, my concerns when it comes to what information is out there and whether or not it's advertising, media, press releases from universities, wh whatever, is that it's truthful and that it's um, <laughs> well that it's accurate. And one of my concerns with vaping, for instance, is more people think vaping is more harmful than combustible cigarettes than the other way around. That is only going to make people continue to smoke and not even consider moving from a more dangerous product to a less because why would you? Why would you switch for something you like if you actually think that it's as harmful if not more harmful? Um, it's not. That's not true. But there's so much media out there that would lead you to believe that. I mean there's studies that were just published that are completely fraudulent saying that vaping causes heart attacks. It doesn't cause a heart attack. That data used to come to that conclusion was before e-cigarettes even existed. But that's not what's out there. And so my concern is that, you know, you can have a, you can have a healthy discussion on how to, how to curb the next opioid crisis and how to, um, you know, prevent youth access, but you have to be leading it with the accurate information. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, my name's Anthony. Um, I uh, intern with Congressman LCSA's office. Um, so as a student, I guess, um, class, I'm a student at Howard University, um, I feel like uh, restricting the access of actual drugs and certain, uh, um, I guess, just the restriction of actually pre like preventing teens and students and other people abusing drugs is kind of, I guess, non-realistic in a way because it's so easily accessible, and like especially uh, neighborhoods like where uh, People kind of use the drugs like for uh, psychological reasons or using for actual finance, financial reasons, and other things like that. So I wanted to know, like, what kind of alternatives would you say that you can put into that you can kind of implement into schools and other uh, and other uh, communities and stuff like that to kind of educate more people, like not really always expressing the negatives of right. the actual drug use, right. but actually the positives of why people do, do use the drug use, to kind of. I guess sparking innovation as to where it could be like, okay, people use drugs because they feel like that's the only thing getting into the next day, like you said. What can we use? What can what can be the alternative to drug use? One thing that always than, sorry, go on. Oh yeah. But basically like what what can be the alternative to drug use rather than just having to use it for like uh, getting through to the next day, especially in like neighborhoods that can't afford certain treatments or certain programs and certain things like that. Like uh, like even in Chicago. I know they don't have a lot of programs. Like they, they're trying to implement more programs to actually prevent any more opioid crisis or anything like that. So what can we do? Right. One know? thing that occurs to me, with especially with alcohol and tobacco use, is that it's very social. I mean, when you're and when you're asking people to give up alcohol, when you're asking people to give up uh, smoking, you're asking them to give up more than just that drug. They're, you're asking them to give up their social circle, their their work breaks, their life after work. Um, you know, it, when you're talking about high school kids, you're asking them to like ditch their friends. You're, it's we have to recognize that there are reasons why people do this, and it's not just escapism, but there's also positive um, aspects to these. And so maybe having a program or you know more structure around social activities that don't involve harmful behaviors would be a start. But You know, I, I do actually, and I, I don't mean this in a coy way, but do you have an idea about what might, or what, um, what do you think could help? I would feel like, uh, I guess more interaction on social media or uh, getting in between like the social, uh, I haven't really thought about it a lot, yeah. but like more, more like, um, I guess trying to target more youth. I think if, Rather if than people, just like uh, certain communities, like full of yeah. adults and, and youth, because I feel like 
a lot of the time, anxiety is so is increasing in a lot of uh, because of social media. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I feel like that's the reason a lot of uh, teenagers and a lot of students and a lot of kids kind of use um, more drugs, and they're using drugs and they can judge different. Like, they're taking away the negative stigma of drugs, which is a good thing, but it can lead to like other people feeling as if I feel a type of way, so I'm going to use drugs and because it's so positively because it's so positively enforced. I can use the drugs for it. Right. I guess kind of just trying to steer students and young, younger people from using drugs as a uh, as a negative. And I think, I yeah, I think I think those are exactly it. My my answer, which is a little outside of this discussion today, but is that I, I think pe people fundamentally have to have hope, and they and there's a lot of communities where, where young people don't have a lot of hope. Um, but there's also some pretty interesting discussion in parenting literature around it doesn't, it's taking grown up in a young person's life, uh, and it can be a coach, it can be a teacher, it can be someone's for big brothers, big sisters, and it doesn't even, it can be just a couple months, summer camp, something, one grown up that really connects with this kid and gives them hope that they have potential to make a life of themselves, and, and that, that can be all it needs. So I'm a huge fan of, you know, let's bring more basketball courts in, let's bring more sports in, let's bring more, you know, try to create safer communities. Let's, like, like you said, let big brothers, big sisters. Anything we can get a young person has a dysfunctional adult role model so they can have access to a functional adult role model, and maybe that's someone who can help them navigate it. Um, but, but what we're talking about today is a lot of a lot of things that that on a population level are very problematic. They're problematic for how we spend our money as a society um, because because of, of chronic disease management. Um, they're problematic for how I take care of individuals, and I think, I think our, so to speak, is um, strangely enough, the concept of harm reduction, especially in traditional healthcare, is controversial. Um, among many of my physician colleagues, the idea of saying anything other than an abstinence-only idea, which you know we see with sex education, right, which is super ineffective, we're right? But we're we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about sex because if we talk about it, you're gonna have it. And meanwhile, everyone's having sex. We're just not talking about it. So, so um, abstinence only, like, it's bad, don't do it, drugs. It's bad, don't do it, cigarettes. It's bad, don't do it, sex. It's bad, don't do it. It doesn't, that's not, that doesn't acknowledge human behavior, right? It doesn't acknowledge how interwoven this is in, in relationships and sense of hope and what kind of community you have and what other resources you have. So, so it's, it may be so obvious, but... What we're talking about are some really hot topics in healthcare where what's accepted is don't do it. That's accepted as the standard of care or the standard approach. And unfortunately, it's going to take political policy to open the doors to being able to say, look, cigarettes are bad for you. Are you willing to switch to a vaping device? Are you willing to switch to a heat not burn cigarette? There's robust data that these are 95% less harmful and it's simply because you're removing the products of combustion. So what the heck's are products of combustion? They're the crap that's released when you burn a cigarette at 1600 degrees. And they include Mr. Clean, which is ammonia, Vicks VapoRub, which is menthol, paraffin wax, which is that crap you stuck in your hand in at the trainer in high school, if you ever played with that, if anyone's ever seen those. Um, what else is in there? Formaldehyde, which is embalming fluid, basically. I mean, all the Windex, right? I mean, it's basically like taking every cleaner you've ever had and the cleanest person you know's house, not the natural stuff, all the chemical stuff, and like <laughs> aerosolizing it and then just inhaling it, right? So you can also get your nicotine. So as a physician to say, let's give people their nicotine and remove all that, that's going to garner me probable disfavor because what people hear is I'm saying it's okay to smoke. It's not okay to smoke. It's not okay to do opiates. These are things that are harmful. They're harmful to individuals. They're harmful to families. They're harmful to our society. But clearly the don't do it doesn't work. So, so can we modify the environment in which people do it so it's safer? Can we give people access to syringes, which a lot of people see as saying opiates are okay. We're not saying injecting drugs is okay. Injecting drugs is a terrible idea and it's horrible for your health. But at bare minimum, if you're gonna do it, do it with a clean needle, right? Then you're not gonna get abscesses and infections and spread MRSA and hepatitis C and HIV. So, so if we tell people they should carry naloxone with them if they're gonna to choose to do opiates, well, A, if you're doing illicit drugs, you're not really like high on the responsibility list, but we'll go with it. Um, and, and actually, to survive a heroin addiction, you have to be extremely sophisticated because the mathematical calculations are actually very difficult. Um, and my cousin died of a, a heroin overdose, so um, she was a nurse. 
so she needs better math skills. Um, but, but people can't be relied on to do what's in their best interest, and there's population consequences of that. But, but if people are given options to know there's a place where they're going to be heard and treated with dignity, maybe we can convert people slowly down a path that leads to, to something better. Maybe not perfect, but better. Well, I think you answered my question, which is if you were to, if all of us were to think about tobacco or opioids, for you guys to come go back to your offices um, or where you work to tell your bosses one thing, what would it be? I think you've answered that. Mine would be, um, you know, prevention programs really do work. We have tobacco control policies that have brought us to where we are in smoking rates, but there are people that are left behind, and that, those are the people that I hope we are all thinking about when we're developing policies around, um, you know, e-cigarette innovation or opioid pain management or any for birth control access. Um, and you can all access rstreet.org and look at where I view all, look where I stand on all these. But where, what do you think, Dr. Mendel? Okay, I just say one simple thing, which is that you know, innovation is a way of making people better off. And besides that. I'm with everything Dr. Donner says. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Pleasure having you.